What is up guys, Control here, and today's video is going to be the Teemo Sejuani Full Guide. This will not have any gameplay in it at all, it will just be me going over the deck, and it's going to be pretty long. But, I do have gameplay, linked in the end cards or in the description if you're interested. Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen quite a bit of gameplay for this deck, because there is a ton on my channel. But hey, I'll link it there in case you guys are interested in it. Anyways, on to the guide. So first up, the deck is pretty straightforward, I don't think there's really too much to say as far as building it goes. There's a lot of different options as far as tech cards can go for the deck list, but I do think there's a pretty solid core of about 35 cards. I consider it a 35 out of 40 core for my preference. That being said, it may not be what you choose to run in the deck. That's fine. Go over tech cards in a little bit, but we're just going to talk about the core now, cards now and why I run them. Thermogenic Bean is just kind of an auto include. There's really not too, too much to say about this card. Very, very strong. It's a card that sees play in almost every single PNC deck just because of how powerful it is early game mid game late game just scales super super well it can have a couple awkward turns when you have say 13 mana and you have to play it instantaneously to remove a huge unit right away but you know otherwise it's a very very good card good to keep almost always in a, a very very strong card throughout the game next up is elixir of iron this is one that i think a lot of people actually don't like that much compared to me i'm personally a huge fan of this card i think it's very very good in the best combat spell you can run in this deck i i think that's because one its cost is very very cheap uh, it's very good, obviously, for protecting Teemo. That's going to be, you know, the most often used kind of reason that you play with it. But it's just always almost playable. There's not going to be too many cases where you're going to use all of your spell mana. You're almost always going to have as an, as an option or just like a potential bluff even with one spell mana left over to kind of just say, well, does your opponent even want to grasp like say your 2-2 two, two Teemo because you can play Elixir Vine into it. They don't know, right? They might not want to because of that, which is great. Just the, the threat of it being there is huge. And I mean, when it is played, it's massive, saving your unit from the Vile Feast early. You know, even later on, uh, it's, it's very good in the context of like saving a Sejuani from like a Thermo on curve, for example, if they don't have spell mana. It's very, very good in the context as well of Starlet Seer, Puffcat Peddler, two cards we're going to talk about in a little bit. But the Elixir of Iron is phenomenal with those as it protects them for one and two, it does make their effect get triggered. It's a very, very solid card. I like it as a three of, some people might not, but for me, I find this card to be core and one that you do want to be running in this deck all the time. Next up is Omen Hawk. This card is effectively just auto include unless you're playing some fizz shenanigans with Starlet Seer. Otherwise, you just play this in any failure deck. The card is bonkers. It is one that I'm kind of surprised hasn't been nerfed so far, and I would not be surprised if it gets nerfed in the future. Very, very powerful. I mean, it does what you want to do in this deck, which is buff your units up, and, well, Omen Hawk gets it started on turn one. Super solid card. Next up, probably my favorite card in the entire deck, Teemo. This is one of the champions, one of the reasons why the deck works, but not the only reason why. So, obviously, he's a 1-mana one 1-1. One, one. Nexus Strike, plant 5, Poison Puff Caps on random cards in the enemy deck. Cool. That doesn't sound too great. But, I mean, obviously, as you guys have probably seen, if you're checking out this guide, you've probably seen a video or two, right? So you see the crazy stuff that Teemo does. He has the plunders. He enables your Sejuani to be leveled post-level up. I mean, all the streams that you're putting in the deck with the Teemo are going to allow the Sejuani to kind of pop off, have this whole kind of mega perma-freeze effect happen where you just stonewall your opponent from being able to do anything. Very, very strong. And, you know, sometimes they shuffle like 200 streams in their deck and just win that way. Which is really, really fun and... Probably the card that leads me to kind of just want to play this type of archetype. And I mean, it wouldn't even exist, actually, if Teemo didn't exist. Definitely one that's worth protecting. A card for playing around with this deck and one that you want to have up and online at all points possible. I just feel Archer is one of those cards that I feel like a lot of people do not think should be in the deck. And I can see why they would think that. It's just a 2-mana 3-1 with the play effect of Frostbite. It's not playable during combat, which isn't insane compared to something like Brittle Steel, which a lot of people would prefer to see in a slot. We'll get to Brittle Seal a little bit later, but Ice Veil Archer is very powerful because the card is very good on your opponent's attacking turns if they need to develop, say on turn three for like a Zed. That's not, you know, one of the most common scenarios you play this early and when it will pop off. It's also very good into Ezreal because you do Frostbite the Ezreal, so then he cannot attack with the Nexus Strike, so he does not get the Mystic Shot off of that. Very important to know for that. Also a card that does scale quite well. Later on in the game with Tusk Reader, he is going to be a 6-2, which means with Stormclaw Ursine, he will have Overwhelm, which is really good. Pretty specific scenario, but one that happens more often than not. And he's also very good at just freezing larger units later on. So for that reason, I think this card is definitely very powerful and one that you will want in the deck. Mystic Shot is a very straightforward card in this deck. It gives you the spell synergy you want for the Starless Seer, Puffcat Peddler, and it offers very solid removal for two health units. It's definitely by no means the best card in the deck. If it, if it said two mana deal three damage, it probably would be the best card in the deck, but then it would also be the best card in the game. The reason why it's so good and why we run it as a three of is because it activates plunder, which is massive in this deck with, uh, you know, the kind of addition of our later game cards, Tusk Reader, Ursa and Spirit Walker and Sejuani. Uh, we'll kind of get to those later, but for the Sejuani, she's flipped after you deal damage to the enemy's Nexus, 
you get to do the Mega Frostbite stuff, which is insane with Mystic Shot being a playable card in this deck because the Mystic Shot then comes out, activates that effect, or just, you know, gets one of the five plunders to level up the set you want. It's a very common way to play with that card as well. You can also use it with Assurance Spoils to get the draw off if necessary. It's a good transition to Assurance Spoils. Also a solid card in this deck, one of the ones that I think is also a little bit underrated. Uh, that being said, for the first 30 games or so that I played with Teemo Sedge originally, I thought I was going to cut this. I didn't like it a lot. But after playing with it a ton more, I actually do really think the card is super good and core. It's one of the ones that takes a situation where you're slightly winning, and it kind of pushes that ahead to really winning. That being said, it does have a double-edged sword effect to it, where when you're behind, it gets quite a bit worse. You can still use it with Starlet Seer if you have that on board to get like the double buff, which is good without the draw. But you really do want to hold this for the draw effect if you can. Feels really bad to play it without it, unless there's a Starlet Seer Puffcat Peddler on board. So I'd recommend waiting for that. That being said, if you, if you have to play it, just play it. I mean, you know, you really can't do too much sometimes. And, you know, in some cases you will just lose because you draw like Spoils or Sign and Tusk Reader in your hand. And well, there's not too much you can do there, right? But that's the same with any other deck. There's always going to be, you know, possibilities of hands where you really just can't win. Cards are just going to work together. But, you know, in most cases you will be able to draw cards that do work with it and it is going to pop off. That's why I kind of consider it like a 2 out of 3 as core, whereas I'll usually run it as a 3 of when I play the deck. But as a 2 of, I think that's pretty manageable. You're not going to get, you know, cases where you draw 3 and they're unplayable. It'll only be 2 max. And I mean, honestly, they're usually going to be playable in most cases. So it's really not that bad. And when it does go off, the card is nuts. It's also one of your only gas engines and one of the only ways you have to draw with this deck, which I don't think is also super necessary. I'll get to that in the tech card section, but I don't think the draw is super crucial for this list. But the Shared Spoils draw, the Tusk Reader draw is nice. So I recommend running this as a two of. Next up, we'll kind of combine these two with Starless Seer and Puffcat Peddler. These are two of your engines that do just allow you to win the game. They do do different things. So we'll start with Starless Seer. Starless Seer is one of the ones that just buffs the next unit you draw in your deck, which, you know, sometimes you're going to draw like three spells straight and not have the card work, which is really frustrating. But a lot of the time what will end up happening is you're just going to be turbo buffing a unit. You'll play that unit and that unit will just take over the game. These two units both have like this tag to them that just says remove me or I am going to make it so you lose the game, basically. They, they have a super soft taunt on them and the opponent will almost always just jam their Thermo on the Starlet Seer or the Puffcat Peddler, which if you draw the Teemo or Sejuani later on, you're pretty happy about because I mean, the removal just went into Starlet Seer slash Peddler. And you know, a lot of time you can play some spells like Elixir of Iron to play around those anyways. It's one of the reasons why the Iron is so good is just so you can protect these core units in your deck. Primarily, primarily the core four, Teemo, Peddler, Seer, and the Sejuani. Overall, though, these two cards are very broken because they do just allow you to get these massive boards really early with the Seer. And for the Peddler, even if you don't have a Teemo type of line, Teemo type of curve, what will end up happening is you can get upwards of a one to one ratio of Shroom to card for your opponent's deck. You can put 30 in relatively easily. If you just have a Puff Cat Peddler and you draw one Chump Wump, that is already 16, which is a completely leveled up Teemo. Then you add in a couple other spells with like Mystic Shot, Elixir of Iron Thermos. Uh, basically, that happens when this guy sticks around for a couple of turns. Then your opponent's at a ratio where you're basically plundering every single turn. And it's not even getting lucky. It's just likely at that point, which is ideally where you want to be with this deck. So overall, Starlet Seer and Puffcat Peddler are two of the core units that you're going to want to be keeping most of the time. Just because they enable all of your spells to give you additional effects, which will actually just help you snowball the game out of control and win for yourself. So definitely look for these two cards when you're using your mulligan phase and... Play with them pretty heavily, keep them alive. You don't want to be attacking with them a lot. You want to be like holding them in most cases. A one for one trade with the Starlet Seer Puffcat Peddler and faster matchups is perfectly acceptable as well. But in slower matchups, look for these guys to get juiced up value for you and kind of just snowball the game out of control in your favor. Chump Wump is our only four drop. It's a very, very solid card though. It does give you two spells. So it's very, very insane with the Starlet Seer plus Puffcat Peddler. And it also levels your Teemo up with only one Nexus Strike from the Teemo. Very, very great unit in this deck. It's great for blocking mid-game with. I, I really do wish he was still a 4-4 because he'd be even more insane than he already is, which is bonkers. But he's one of the core reasons why this deck just works straight up is because he does just give you the two Mushroom Clouds. And I kind of hope in the future, in the next couple sets, they do print a couple more Mushroom Clouds cards because then team will get that much nuttier. But Chump Wump's one of the core reasons why this deck works. Very powerful unit. He's aggressive. He's also good at blocking with. So when you're, you know, being aggressed on when you're being defensive, He's very good for just controlling the board, making it so, you, you know, your Nexus doesn't topple over before you get to the Sejuani Tusk Raider part of the game. And he's not a bad draw later on. Honestly, the, the Mushroom Clouds will usually come in handy and, you know, putting 10 Mushrooms in your opponent's deck is always going to be good. So definitely a solid card and a, a very good keep in slower matchups. Okay, so now we're getting to the top end. 
First up, Ursine Spirit Walker. We'll kind of combine, uh, I guess, the top three cards together because they all kind of work together. Ursine Spirit Walker, first of all, is a 5-mana 4-6. Plunder, I transform into a certain plot. Ursine. You don't really ever want to play this as a 5-mana 4-6 unless you're falling behind and you absolutely need this block to happen. Then, you know, just jam it. Sometimes you have to do what you have to do. But this is the one you really want. 5-mana 6-6 six, six Overwhelm. This on curve by itself is insane. And it only gets better later on in the game as you buff units up because, well... We can transition to the next card we're going to talk about, which is Tusk Raider. This card uh, is an 8 mana 7 7 plunder, double the power and health of all allies in the deck. Which means that anything but Omenhawk, Teemo, and the Starlet Seer will then have Overwhelm if a Ursine is in play, which is busted. Absolutely crazy. And one of the main ways you win outside of Teemo Sejuani is just going to be. After Tusk Raider, having the Ursine Spirit Walker give everything Overwhelm, and you just literally overwhelm your opponents. You, you sometimes don't even need Tusk Raider in play to do that with Spirit Walker though because of Starlet Seer. Sometimes you just get enough buffs, enough of a juiced up unit that the Ursine Overwhelm is just going to be good enough to win you the game without Teemo and Sedge. That being said, you don't always just need the Plunder effect to go off to play this card. A lot of the time, you're just going to need to have a Sedge you want in turn 9 and you can't really greed this in every single situation. In faster matchups, you definitely can just play it on 8 if you do need a Sedge for 9. In slower ones though, I would say always try to greed it if possible. But you know, a 5-6 Sejuani for 6 mana is still pretty good. It, it just so happens that a 10-12 is a little bit better. Or a lot, I don't know. Overall, really, really good card though, and I think one that is really underrated in this deck, and one that I would say if you don't like right now, play it. It's really good. I personally play it as a 2-up for the most part. Uh, I, I do think that the metagame is slow enough right now that it is good enough. That being said, it's not always the best in, say, the Ezreal matchups, but I mean, we don't really win those anyways. So overall, I'm a pretty big fan of this card. And lastly, we're going to talk about Sejuani. Also want to talk a little bit more about Teemo here because these two kind of just go hand in hand and they really do just work together. Sejuani, you need to damage the enemy Nexus five times to then flip and get the level up Sejuani, which will then give you the AoE Frostbite effect. It can get triggered on Shrooms at the start of the round and it will only trigger once per round. So it's important to keep in mind. Another big thing is once you get your fifth tick and Sejuani levels up, you can then deal damage to the Nexus again to then have the Sejuani effect trigger the same round that she is leveled. So keep that in mind. Very powerful way to utilize her effect and one that I think people forget about sometimes when they're new to the deck. So how does Teemo work with this? Card you play on turn one that's an elusive unit that kind of just pops and says, hey, remove me or I'm just going to keep on hitting and putting shrooms in the deck. The more shrooms you have in the deck, the more likely it is to get a plunder on your non-attack phase. So when you're defending which is really, really good in one of the ways you can just have the Sejuani leveled up by six, which I have done before and is really, really nice to see. It, there's almost no better feeling in this game than to have the leveled up Sejuani in six with like a leveled up Teemo and just, ooh, absolutely just decimating your opponent that early in the game. Usually it doesn't happen though, it usually takes a little bit longer, but it's pretty easy to get there and it's one of the core things you're gonna be doing when you're playing this deck is looking for these Sejuani plunders. You wanna get those online and that's gonna be one of the main ways that you win. It's just gonna be having her level up Hit the Perma Frostbite effect and then just have the Sejuani attack first and all of your little units to the right of her. And then boom, Sejuani does the overwhelm damage, gives your opponent's entire board the Frostbite and then all of your cards straight into all of their cards and you just get a huge tempo lead out of that. I think another important thing to mention as far as Sejuani goes is Fury of the North. We don't run this main deck because you actually do end up having a lot of Sejuani's in hand I find when I play this deck. Because of the Tusk Reader, it does draw you a Sejuani and a lot of time you already have a Sejuani on turn six. So then you get a Sejuani's Fury of the North. Obviously, that one would be a you know double-sided one. But still, it's still decent to play as a Fury of the North, especially if you have a Spirit Walker up. Because then the Spirit Walker will give literally any unit that isn't Frostbitten the Overwhelm tag. So you can then make, I don't know, your 3-3 three, three Puffcat Peddler a 7-7 seven, seven with Overwhelm, for example. Which, if, is, if it's being blocked by a 1-1, one, one, can be enough to win the game with. So definitely keep an eye out for that. As the Ursine effect is just an aura, it's not a play effect. So you can, in fact, buff the units to give them overwhelm at really at any given time and steal games out of nowhere. So now we're in attack cards. And the first one up is just going to be Brittle Seal. I'm just going to go down from P and Z and Failure and look at all the cards that I think are going to be relevant. And well, the first one's Brittle Seal, a card that I feel like is asked about a lot. And the reason why I don't run this is because I do think that the fact that Ice Veil Archer is a 3-1 and a unit is more valuable than just having another spell like Brittle Seal. That being said, in addition to Ice Veil Archer, you can run Brittle Seal or there's nothing wrong with actually replacing the Ice Veil Archers with Brittle Seal. They do have great synergy with Starlet Seer, Puffcat Paddler. We talk about spells a lot and they are very, very good in this deck. And I mean, it is usable during combat, which Ice Veil Archer is not. I just personally find that Ice Veil Archer in most cases is going to be better. And I really like the card post Tusk Raider buff. I think it's really insane then. And that's one of the reasons why I like to keep it. 
Because with the Spirit Walker, it's just another big overwhelm unit. And in general, I just I like a later a little bit later on in the game to kind of deny the bigger units hitting. Because I think the Brittle Seal has like a kind of similar fallback to Elixir of Iron, and that it's just a one mana burst spell that kind of just falls off later on in the game. Whereas Ice Veil Archer stays relevant. Next up, let's figure it out. We are going to go to Avarosa Sentry. Could even potentially run Zonite Urchin. We can kind of combine those. So we just early draw effects. Zonite Urchin a little bit worse because you don't want to discard streams. It's not really right for this deck. But Sentry is a card that I also get asked about quite a bit. And you know, it's a 2 meta 2 1, last breath, draw 1. And one of the issues a lot of people find that they have with this deck is that it does not draw enough. And I think, you know, you're looking in the right place with the Sentry. It's, it's definitely not the worst card in the entire world and one that you could run. I, I personally don't like it because I think the body's a little bit too small and it doesn't really help you fight for board too much. And I don't think that we have really enough comeback mechanics to kind of just rely on this uh, as like a, you know, kind of early game 2-1 draw because it is just so bad later on and it feels like it just does not do enough early. And I usually prefer to play like a Starlet Seer or Puff Cat Paddle or even Spell Mana over playing this early on. That being said, again, it's not that bad of a card and one that I could see being run in the deck. So feel free to jam it if you want to. Next up is Clump of Wombs. This is one that we did previously run. I think the card's fine. It's just not that fast of a metagame. So I don't think there's really too much value from a 2 mana 2-2 two -two if it just gives you a Mushroom Cloud. Obviously, it will help you with Teemo early if you want to level him up just based on the clouds that you draw or the attacks that you get in. If you want to attack earlier, which is really nice. And it does have a lot of synergy with Starlet Seer and Puffcat Paddler. But I think it's a body. It's just a 2 mana 2-2 two -two that I am not really the biggest fan of having. That being said, I did run this for a long time, had really good results with it, and I don't think it's a bad card. So if you want to be running this, you want more Mushroom Clouds, hey, do it. It's a decent card. Next up, I like the Shared Spoils as the 3 of, so you can kind of mention that. Uh, I personally prefer this card almost always to be a 3 of in the deck. I don't think it's completely core because, again, it does have a pretty big downside to it. But as a card that can be played in the list, I'm a pretty big fan of it as a 3 of. That kind of transitions us to the next playable 2 drop in the deck, I think. Veteran Investigator. This is one that a lot of people actually asked me about. I said I would play, but I didn't actually get around to it. I tried a different version with Trapper instead. But this is one that I should play with because... Well, it's actually really fun and can lead to some pretty cool highlight clips and you have a lot more streams in your opponent's deck. So the logic behind this uh, is kind of just that you would go ahead and make your opponent draw streams later on in the game when you have a lot in their deck for maybe lethal or just a plunder effect if you need it when you're like, say, on a one to one ratio or so and you miss that one to one draw for the, the shroom for them. So I think that in that case, it's fine. My problem is it's kind of a two drop. You don't really want to play on turn two in a lot of cases. So it does give you the draw, but it also gives your opponent the draw. And the thing with that is your opponent could then just overwhelm you with, you know, their aggression early, potentially. They also get more removal cards, a better curve. It just, it doesn't really make me that happy. Like, yes, we're going to get it, but I don't think that the benefit from having this effect applied to us early will be the same as the benefit that's going to be applied to them. So I prefer to not play this at all early and then just save it for later on in the game. But I mean, at that point, you're not going to play it in all your games because you're not always going to make it to the late game phase. And then you don't want to hold this against aggro and it just feels really bad, but... In a slower metagame, I could see this for sure, which we're kind of in right now, but it's still not really my preference, I think. And, you know, maybe it's my fault for not playing it, trying it out and, and you know, really seeing exactly how good it is. Because, you know, a lot of you guys are swearing by it, but for me, I just I haven't tried it. So I, I'm going to say that, you know, I can't really say too, too much about it other than I don't feel like it would be that great in the deck or one that you really want to play. But, you know, I, I'm open to um, to debate on it. You know, I will eventually try this card and. I, I hope to be surprised because it is a really fun one. Moving on to threes. Can start with the Marksman. This is a decent option if there are a lot of one health units in the meta you want to ping. Say Teemo becomes the best champion in the game overnight. Well, Avaros and Marksman might be the move then. Very good. It's not an elusive unit. It's just, a, a, you know, something that has a play effect. Gives you the, the bullseye and then boom, Teemo's dead. Not the case right now though, so I wouldn't really run it. Not worth it. But another Avaros and homie. Avaros and Trapper was a card that I actually just tried relatively recently. Basically because I played Ash Sejuani and, well, this card's very, very good in that deck. But that's kind of because of Trefarian Assessor, so, you know, not super related, but it turns out drawing a bunch of cards and having units that have five or more power is good for some reason. I don't know why. But yeah, I tried it in this deck because of that. And I found that when I played this card on turn three, it was pretty good if I drew the Yeti on turn four or five. That being said, by the time it hit turn six, I usually had a Sejuani that I would want to play at that point. And then, well, the Yeti got a little bit awkward. So, you know, two thirds of the time it felt pretty good. And when it's drawn late, it's not always the best because, you know, when you're on turns like 9 or 10, you're going to want to be having the units uh, in your deck be a little bit bigger than a 1 mana 5 5 because, well, you don't really care too, too much about the cost of a card later on. So it's really something that gives you a lot of benefit when drawn early, but it's still not terrible later on because, well, you are going to have the Spirit Walkers to kind of work with the Enraged Jetties and still pop off. 
So I don't think it's a terrible option and one that we actually saw a decent amount of success with. It, it worked pretty well. I, I did play three trappers. I played three Earthside Spirit Walkers and two Tusk Readers. Those were kind of my tech options for the stack uh, in the session that I played this and it went all right. I, I feel like it's okay. It gives you a little bit more pressure against uh, some decks like Ezreal TF potentially, which is really nice. And it just gives you more options as far as curving out goes. So I think it's decent for that. And one of the tech cards I would recommend actually running. I think it's good. Dead Excite is an honorable mention because people do like this card a lot. The problem with this deck, I think, is that we don't really have great cards to discard. And we don't draw a lot. So if you're discarding cards, you know, you're really not left with too much to play with. So I don't think it's worth it for that reason. You know, dealing three damage is really nice, especially the ability to go face with this card makes it an awesome option because you can just burn opponents out of games of stream sometimes with it. But it's not the right deck for it, in my opinion. We've decided Kindly Tavern Keeper. This is a card that I definitely think makes a cut. It's super good and one that can be a very solid tech card. I, I've been playing it as a one of recently. In again, faster metagames, we played it as a three of. It's very powerful then and super, super strong. Even in your solar matchups, you know, healing up Sejuani has been damaged is really good. Or just your Nexus sometimes, you will need to have to have three more health to play around certain cards that will kill you. So overall, really solid card and one that I would recommend running as well. Moving forward, we can talk about, I guess, another combat buff, but I mean, you're not going to play this really. It's not so much to say here. It's just kind of bad. Uh, it's fun though. I guess the next real consideration is probably some treasures for a similar reason to, uh, you know, just the Sentry and the Zana Urchin. That being said, I mean, you're not always going to want to have the discard online and you do need to discard something to play this card. And I don't think you're going to be really wanting to throw away Shrooms with this deck, so I don't think it's really the right fit. I think that you could play Use Cast Salesman though. That would definitely be a decent option to enable the plunder effect in your opponent's turn. The only issue is then you are also killing yourself. And this isn't a deck that has the best defensive tools in the entire world outside of a leveled up Sejuani. But I mean, it gets you towards your best defensive solutions. So in that case, if you need a three drop and some chump blockers, you feel like that would be good. The minion based metagame without like fearsome units, then hey, this card could be pretty good. I could see it actually being very good in like an Ash Sejuani matchup, for example. So, you know, if that's a very popular deck, maybe try decking this card in. It's one that uh, I actually haven't personally tried, but I think could be okay. So, you know, feel free to jam a couple games. Let me know how it goes. Get on to the four drops now. Babbling Bjerg is one that I think is kind of underrated. It's a card that in super, super slow metagames will give you a Sejuani or a Tusk Reader. Uh, obviously, that's before the Tusk Reader goes and gets a Plunder effect off. It gets significantly worse after that because then you basically draw anything in the deck, which is still okay, you know, but it's not great. But giving yourself a Sejuani or Tusk Reader is pretty nice. That being said, Tusk Raiders are already tutor for the Sejuani, but if you want to double down on it. You know, maybe you don't want to run two Tusk Raiders like I like. You want to run a Beard and a Tusk Raider to kind of just meet in the middle of having cards that are playable and not playable. Definitely a good option then. You can also do Bloodsworn Pledge. This card, it does give you a permanent buff on like Elixir of Iron, but it's a little bit too expensive for its cost, in my opinion. That being said, it is one of those cards that never sees play for the most part. It usually is a one of in some decks and... You know, it's it's good for throwing people off and they would almost never expect it. So for that reason, you could play it to protect like your chemo, your seer, your peddler, or even Sage in some cases. So I, I'd say, hey, if, you, if you're interested in this card, you think it'd be good. Give it a spin. It's definitely not the worst option in the entire world. Moving forward, gets the Fury of the North. This is one of the ones that, again, I don't really like too, too much because you do get the Sejuani Fury, Fury of the North a lot. It is a very good card later on the game, but one that's quite expensive to play early. You really want cheap spells with the Starlet Seer and Puffcat Peddler. You don't really want these super, super expensive ones. That being said, it does protect the Teemo super well or any other unit that you have and will give units overwhelm with the Spirit Walker flip. So it is a good card. It's just one that I'm not a fan of. If you want to run it, run it as a one over two of, in my opinion. Moving forward to Gotcha, it's one of the ones that, I mean, we just don't have enough draw to really make work. It is a good removal card though, but you know, we don't run anything that's going to be drawing us a Gotcha and then have the mana left over to play it in most cases. So. Not really the look in my opinion. It is decent when drawn though, but otherwise it's trash. Moving forward to another draw card. This is one that I believe Mogwai played in his Teemo Sejuani deck. It is Insightful Investigator. One that I don't really like enough for the version that I play because we just don't run too many cards that are two drops. So because of that, I don't think this card makes a cut. If you wanted to revamp the deck and include a lot of two cost cards, then you know this card could be fine, but it would be a different core and therefore a fairly different deck. But in this version, not worth running. Moving forward to one of my favorite options, Static Shock. This is a card that enables the Plunder effect, so you can have the Tusker to Sedge or Ursine go off, same as Shared Spoils, and it also draws you a card. So it kind of does two things that you really, really want. That being said, it's not the best removal card in the world. There's not a lot of key one health units in the meta right now, so you know, you're usually going to have to be blocking something and then you know Static Shocking it maybe to deal the last damage if you're lucky. Otherwise, I play this a lot just as a four mana ping to my opponent's Nexus to Either have the Frostbite effect go off or, you know, level up the Sejuani and then also for the draws massive. I usually play this as a two of in most of the versions that I prefer right now. 
I think it's a super good card. Could definitely play it as a three, one of, two of. I would recommend looking at this heavily though, because these kind of spells do just go face and allow you to protect yourself slash level up besides you wanting to protect yourself in the future are phenomenal. And that kind of moves us to a card that I get asked about a ton, suit up. I actually don't even remember if I've actually talked about this or not because I actually fully recorded this and I actually went ahead and had my mic muted like halfway through. So I'm just redoing it now to be about, uh, I think I'm like two hours deep of just straight talking today, which is kind of draining. And I'm sure I will be very slow during my stream this evening, but that's fine. Anyways, back to the card, suit up. When drawn, costs two less this round, it's an ally to 4-4. Four, four. So for one, it has the issue like gotcha, where you want to draw that round and we just don't have card draw to make it work. It's not a card you can keep in your mulligan, which is really the only time it's good is super, super early. So we're looking like the first three turns because after you play like the Teemo and the Omenhawk, I mean, your hits really aren't very good for suit up. You can play it on like Starlet Seer and that's decent. Outside of that, card's kind of bad though. And it only gets worse after Tusk Raiders play or, you know, Starlet Seer buffs are happening. So for that reason, it's a card that seems very good in the, you know, vacuum of suit up plus Teemo. Does that mean, hey, making your team a 4-4 is dope, but it kind of sucks in every other case. And if you want to keep it early to make that happen consistently, oh, well, you're paying four mana for it, which in my opinion is not really worth it. So in my opinion, this is not a card you should be running. As you get more expensive, I mean, there's a lot of cards you could talk about, but I don't think there's really too, too much room for anything other than, you know, the third Ursa and Spirit Walker and potentially the second Tusk Reader. I don't think you ever go three out of three Tusk Readers. It's way too clunky. You get those in your hand too often and... Well, whine and cry about it like I do, and you don't want to do that. But, you know, the third Spirit Walker is definitely a relevant inclusion in the deck. I do think that if you're going to be running that version, though, you do want to be playing the Trappers. So I guess, it, it, you know, an example of that type of deck, this is one that I was running a couple nights ago. It was just a Triple Trapper. You go for a third Spirit Walker, and you go for a second Tusk Reader. That's a, a decent version of Timo Sejuani, and one that I played a little bit. Uh, that being said, it was not my most successful version. The most successful one is the one that I tell you guys in that deck all the time, the one that you play a lot. But, you know, that version can be varied. So I'm going to make it real quick here. Get the statics in. Boom. Two of my wonderful tech choices here. Then we go Tavern Keeper. Three drop. Yeah, kindly Tavern Keeper. And then we throw in one more Tusk Reader. And the last one's going to be the third Shared Spoils. And this is the version that I played with the most. So my tech options are the third Shared Spoils, the second Tusk Reader, two Static Shopics, and one kindly Tavern Keeper. I think it's perfectly fine. There's nothing really wrong with it. It kind of fills some holes you want. Tavern Keeper is a nice, just overall general card to play. I really like it a lot. I think Shared Spoils is activated enough and helps you kind of snowball your lead into a way that you're going to be able to dominate games and win more. So I like it for that reason. It gives you cards, which I like a lot. Static Shock is one of the most versatile cards you can play with. It's super sweet because, I mean, you can use it for removal. You can use it to freeze. You can use it for draw. This is a very dynamic card, and that's one of the things that I am the biggest fan of in this game is when you have a lot of options to use with your cards. More so than, say, well, I guess like a Tusk Reader, which only does really one thing. You can say two, but it really just does one thing, which is draw a Sejuani. It will buff your deck as well, obviously. But, you know, Tusk Raider is not a very static card, whereas Static Shock is, is my point, basically. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we'll get into Tusk Raider. I like the second Tusk Raider because I think its effect is just bonkers. And I think the play effect is so strong by itself, even without the plunder that, cool. The, the tutor on this is just turbo nuts. So I, I always really like to play with two of these. I, I will go down to one when the metagame is a little bit faster. But for the most part, this is my preferred version. And those are the tech cards that I like. Now we're moving on to Mulligans. This phase gets a little bit more interesting because it's less kind of clear and cut. It's one of the ones that I think you can say in general, you're always going to want at least one Thermo. So if you have one, it's great. Uh, I also do think that you always want Omen Hawk, Starlet Sears, and Teemo. So, you know, you'll keep three of those, for example. Three Omen Hawk hand. Sure, the next unit that I draw is going to be plus three, three. Great. That's insane. I just went off that. Teemo, I mean, you're, you're never going to have a Teemo die, which is nuts. Or you're never going to run out of Teemo, sorry, which is really, really good. And, you know, you can just play the one Teemo. If it gets the attack in, then you can go ahead and shuffle two clouds in. Boom, he's leveled up and you have two more Teemos in your deck and you're happy. This is really good. And for the Starlet Seer, I mean, triple Starlet Seer plus any spell is just like plus three, three. So that's going to win you the game on the spot already. So those are generally going to be the ones that you want no matter what. I think if you have any of those units, an Elixir of Iron becomes more valuable, especially with a Teemo and Starlet Seer, less so with the Omen Hawk. You don't really want to keep that with Omen Hawk. But with Teemo or Starlet Seer, Elixir of Iron becomes insane. I think in your faster matchups, you should also be looking for Ice Veil Archer. It's a card that's super, super good at making it so your opponent's attack phase is bad. You just, you know, allow them to drop a big unit on their attack phase. Like, say they want to play Zed on turn three. Archer, boom. There you go. Ar Archer gets crazy value. You're super happy about it. And I think another card that can be good in faster matchups, if they do have units with two health, like think Zed and Lucian, Mystic Shot. I think it's also one that you can keep if you have, like, a Starlet Seer in a matchup that's, you know, a little bit more mid-range. Like, say, a Demacia one. You want to just like say, you know, trade like your Ice Veil Archer and like a Mystic Shot into Garen. Boom. There you go. Great trade. 
we'll look at a little bit too forward uh too far ahead but still it's uh it's a decent thing to do is just think a couple turns ahead think about why would you want this card that matchup and i mean against aggro removing stuff with mystic shot is usually going to be a good shout so try to keep it for that reason then your slower matchups this gets a little bit uh more wonky and kind of hand dependent but if you have like any form of early game so that the hawk teemo or seer then it becomes okay to keep stuff like chump Wump, i think and even in some cases where your hand is a little bit above average already, like say you're keeping like two cards already, then I, I think you could even keep like a Sejuani slash Tusk Reader against uh, very slow decks. Sejuani, you know, is an easier keep in a lot of matchups, but Tusk Reader, if you're, you're thinking the game's going to go to like turn 11, 12, 13, then Tusk Reader is one of the best cards you're going to have in your hand. And I actually will mulligan for the Tusk Reader a lot of times. So I'd say look for that. And one that I actually failed to mention was Puffcat Peddler. I, against basically any matchup, Puffcat Peddler is also fine. The reason why I don't say it's, you know, a general keep or a general auto keep is against very fast decks. It will get punished quite a bit if you try to just, you know, have that card pop off and stay alive because it is three mana. And, you know, generally the way you're going to be using it in this type of matchups is just playing it as a three, three and having a trade, which if that's the case and you think that's going to happen is perfectly fine. I, I guess slower decks of Puffcat Peddler is absolutely insane and is one that I would definitely keep and try to keep alive in, in a similar fashion to Starlet Seer. And we can talk about combo a little bit, but combo in Legends of Runeterra is effectively just going to be Ezreal decks. And, you know, in those decks, you're kind of just going to be really just looking for like a Starlet Sea or Hyrule type of hand. Ezreal matchups are usually going to be our worst. So I guess we can talk about the very worst one. First of all, TF Ezreal. This is a matchup that I, I find to be the hardest one for this deck and really the only one that I, I queue into. And I'm like, OK, well, I'm probably not going to win. It, it's just probably actually the only matchup where I'm negative win rate as well. That's why I have this kind of like, you know, notion where it's like, OK, well, you queue into that matchup, you just can't win. But the best way to do it is to get a Starlet Seer and a bunch of buffed up units, I find. Teemo just always gets removed. It, it, you know, you should still keep it, Teemo if you have them. Try to get those plunders in. Try to get the shrooms in the deck. Still good. Good keep. Nothing wrong with them. Uh, but Starlet Seer, to me, seems like she's going to be the main way that you will win. Or getting to that Sejuani level up. Uh, that being said, when you level up a Sejuani, these play Riptide, Rex, and Killer anyways. So it doesn't really matter. Or Thermo. Or one of their other 17,000 removal spells. But the Seer is very good for early aggression. So definitely look for that. That's going to be your key to winning and going wide and i think that another big thing is just to kind of always go wide against ezreal regardless of what deck you're playing so kind of play for those type of hands where you're playing a lot of units making like a five to six unit board because they usually will not be able to remove all of them in an efficient manner um, unless you're playing ezreal tf and in that case you just kind of complain about it and say you know go next unlucky unfortunately it's one of the strongest decks right now so we're seeing a lot of that uh but you know uh, against like the Karma Ezreal decks, Swain Ezreal decks, you do got to play the game, go wide, and pop off that way. As far as practicing mulligan goes and figuring out what you want to do in specific matchups, I would say what you should do is actually go watch VODs for me on Twitch or just go back to the YouTube videos that I have and say, hey, uh, you know, Team One Trick climbing top 100 masters, boom. You can mute me, you don't even have to listen to me. Uh, go back and look at uh, the starting hand originally and, you know, see, okay, you're against Shen Fiora here. Not a very common matchup, not one you probably want to practice a mulligan against, but still gives you a good idea of what I would look for in this matchup. So we're going to go and just, you know, do a test. So the hand is Tusk Raider, Static Shock, Chump Wump, and Elixir of Iron. You could maybe keep the Wump, I think, but I don't think I would because it's very expensive and I would prefer to have early game cards. So I think that this is a pretty straightforward hard mulligan here. Then you can see if you agree, on pause the video and see what I do. Hard mulligan, boom. I didn't cheat, by the way. That's off, uh, you know, memory. And boom, look at that. That's nuts. Super good hand. This is super fast to do as well, right? You can get through all my videos in like 10 minutes or so, max. Just going through this and seeing, you know, how I mulligan versus how you mulligan. And then Twitch VODs as well will help you a little bit more get through these mulligan kind of practice phases and, uh, you know, figure out if what you're doing matches what I'm doing. I usually talk about the mulligan a little bit and, you know, tell you what I like or what I don't like and you know why a little bit and why do x and y i'm gonna do a couple examples here you guys can get through this pretty fast it's not going to take too too long to go through all the videos i have on youtube uh the vods that on you on, do another one or two just to kind of run you guys through this it's very quick to do and you're gonna, you're gonna get through most of my videos relatively quickly so this one is against i believe mf something like two or three of these to help you guys uh you can get through them very quickly as well if you run out of ones to do on YouTube, you can go ahead and check out my Twitch stream. You can just watch the VODs there. Again, you don't need audio or anything. Uh, none, of, none of it's muted. I don't play music on stream, though. So you will be able to check out the mulligans there that I've done with Timo Sedge. So just, you know, twitch.tv slash control and check the videos out. You can go watch old VODs and do more mulligan practice there. But any of the YouTube videos I have up are awesome for practicing on as well. So here, for example, we're against Quinn and a Misfortune. So definitely a 
faster deck that's trying to play for Bort. So in this case, I think I would keep Thermo, Ice Veil, and Seer, I believe is what I would do. And Mulligan away the Shared, the shared Spoils. If I agree, yeah, pretty quick one, relatively easy, and that's a high roll, baby. Let's go. And we'll do one more practice run with this. Oh, how fun. Ezreal TF, okay. Mystic, Teemo, Peddler, and an Ursa and Spirit Walker. I think that I would probably keep Teemo by himself right now. Mystic Shot is actually a pretty good removal card, and it hits TF. So I actually think I'd probably keep those two, and if that's the case, then I would probably keep Peddler. I feel like I wouldn't keep Mystic Shot if I did not keep Peddler, because I don't think Mystic will be played on two. I would just save Spell Mana and then do that. So I would either just keep Teemo, or I would keep Teemo, Peddler, and Mystic Shot. I'm kind of leaning towards the Teemo, Peddler, and Mystic Shot, because Teemo works so well with Peddler, so the hand just kind of has synergy together. That being said, it doesn't really go wide, and if Teemo kind of dies, then the whole strategy kind of falls apart, which he does most of the time against this deck as well. So I think I would still probably keep these three, because I mean, I think that you have to hope to high roll in this matchup to win, and then I would pitch the Ursai and Spear Walker and hope for like an Elixir Vine or something like that. See what I do? Okay, I actually picked, I pitched the Mystic Shot. That's interesting. Uh, I, I feel like that's fine too, I guess, because the Peddler does work with Teemo. And you know, even now, I disagree with my thoughts there. So, I mean, maybe I played a couple games against TF Ezreal then, and I didn't like the Mystic Shot or something like that. And, I mean, to be fair, it doesn't line up into too much. And, you know, it goes to show that I'm not always right. And, you know, maybe I was right there, but wrong right now. It, it's one of those. Uh, Mulligans are definitely one of the harder parts in card games. And one of the things I think as you play more of the deck, you'll get a better feel with. But, you know, they're going to be one of the best ways you can kind of improve. So, I would say... You know, practice. Wrong mulligans are going to hurt you in the long run over and over again. So always think about this kind of phase of the game. It's a very important one to be mindful of. I also wanted to talk about a couple of prevalent matchups for you guys, just so you have a little bit of an idea of how to play certain very popular ones. So first one is going to be Ash Sedge. This is just Navi's list. Uh, super popular one right now and one that is played a ton across ladders. So you're definitely going to queue into it a lot. One of the things to keep in mind is that they do have a lot of freeze effects, obviously. They also have Reckoning, usually is a 1 or 2 of, which is a card that actually farms our deck super hard because a lot of our units are small. Particularly our units that are going to be buffing other units like the Puffcat Peddler or Starlet Seer are just going to die to the Reckoning and those are the ones we're going to be wanting to play for early on. Uh, notable cards that are going to live are the Spirit Walker if flipped, Sejuani and Tusk Reader, or buffed cards. Other than that, though, all of our small stuff is going to die. So I would say just, you know, keep this in mind. Don't overwhelm the board with units that are lower attack wise later on in the game. You know, you want your chump blockers, but that's about it. And if they're holding six mana for some reason, this is probably the reason why. So, you know, be very careful about that and keep that in mind when playing. I would also say Calling Strike is a card that we should definitely think about a lot. I really like Teemo in this matchup because he will just get Calling right away or he'll take the match over because they don't have anything that's elusive. They do have Brittle Steel type of effects, but that's really their only answer to Teemo. Uh, you know, the, the most common versions don't run any cards that are going to be challenge effects other than the Sejuani for Vulnerable, which will then be able to kill Teemo. Otherwise, they're forced to have Calling Strike or Teemo will take over, though, which is one of the most common ways that I win this matchup. And if Teemo doesn't take over, well, uh, then, you know, gets Callinged, and then there's one less Calling Strike to be played against your Sejuani, which then can flip and be safe. Again, this deck does not really have too much removal outside of, like, the Reckoning and Calling. They have a lot of stall effects, though, and ways to overwhelm the board. So you're going to want to be playing for your champions very heavily, less so than buffs in this matchup. Uh, I mean, the Shroom buff is very good, but Starlet's here is definitely a little bit less valuable. So one of the things that you do need to worry about, again, is like the freeze effects plus calling that'll happen later on. You can't really play around at those, so that's why Teemo is good to bait that out early. One of the reasons why he's a super good card to stack or just win. And later on, I mean, you just want to have the side you want to flip as fast as possible and the ability to play something like a Mystic Shot on your opponent's attack phase to just get that plunder off. Have the Sejuani's effect go off and Mega Freeze their board because this is a deck that goes really wide with big units. And it's one of the reasons why it's so strong right now. It's because there, there really aren't too many decks that are good that can actually deal with a bunch of 5-5s. Five They're just 5 plus attack units that are healthy and just you know crazy at attacking. It, you know, not to mention the fact that Ash just, you know, freezes the entire board and then you just sit there and you can't block and then they win that way too. But that's an even better reason to kind of go for Sejuani and have her flipped and go for those kind of, uh, you know, permafrostbite type of boards. And that's going to be mainly what you're playing for. You're going to want to stall, chump block with your early game units. You know, stuff like the uh, the Tavern Keeper is fine. Chump Lump is a good core unit that does that. Uh, Spirit Walker is as good as a 4-6 in this match, believe it or not. It's one of the ones that is fine in. And I, I would say just play for Sejuani super hard, and that's going to be the main way that you're going to win. Or Teemo, if he goes unanswered, is going to pop off as well. Next up is one that I alluded to a little bit earlier. It's our worst matchup, Ezreal TF. One that's really just 
completely collapse our deck. And I, I mean, I say that because they deal with Teemo early in a very, very straightforward fashion with like the Thermo Beam, Make It Rain, Mystic Shot, Static Shock, Gotcha, all these kind of cards that are going to level up Ezreal are going to clown the Teemo. So Teemo shenanigans almost never work. Sometimes they will, but most of the time they won't. Uh, so don't really look to Teemo too much to win you the game because he really just is not going to work that often. They also have Ezreal uh, to block the Teemo and TF red cards, so it's really not very fun at all. I, I would look to remove Twisted Fate or Ezreal as fast as possible, obviously. Twisted Fate will level up really easily in this deck, and if he is leveled, you're never going to be able to win because you won't be able to attack, basically, with the gold card, red card going off. And, I mean, if he's leveled, they're going to be able to kill you because they'll take control of the game, draw a lot with the blue cards, stun a lot with the gold cards, and AoE damage the reds, so it's kind of just over at that point. So auto-remove the champions if possible. You also have to deal with Riptide Rex on turn 8, but in most cases, I would say just don't play around it because if they do make it to turn 8, they can Riptide Rex clear your board and then play a level up Ezreal and kill you after. You're going to lose, and that's, I mean, the average pano that they will do that. But I, I would say don't play around it. A lot of time, I'd say just play for whatever your best option is. You know, even if that's going all in on Teemo leveling and popping off with him, it's your best option. You got to take it. This matchup is just so low percentage that I think that you have to play assuming that they really have nothing and just go in. You know, you have Seer, some spells. Boom, play like a 5-6, whatever unit, you just draw the next round and try to win with that. Or, you know, you make it to Sedge and hope that she works. That being said, the Tusk Reader is a little bit too slow for this matchup, so it generally will not work. Uh, but, you know, if they're not that wide, if you're relatively even on board, they just Rex your small board away and you can play a Tusk Reader after. That's probably good enough. It'll block the Rex and you'll have a Sedge wanting for the next round, and that's, you know, more than good enough. But you are going to need to pressure them. You have to be the aggressor in this matchup, and you're not going to have a lot of time to win later on because... Ezreal is a ticking time bomb. It is a champion that will just end the game when he does level up and you know, is played with the spells. So you're going to have to be playing fast play with an aggressive mindset. Think that you need to kill them and try to figure out the best way to do that and have that go off. Overall, though, this is your hardest matchup and I would not say that you should feel bad about losing it a bunch. Again, I think it's the only one that I'm negative when reading and well, it's literally Ezreal, so, you know, don't don't be too sad about losing Ezreal. He's a broken champion. And the last deck that I want to talk about is just going to be deep. It's one that I think a lot of people feel like is kind of like an auto loss. But for me, I actually don't really think that's true. I think it's one that you do have to adjust your playstyle a little bit with and not really rely on Teemo early on too, too much. That being said, if you have Teemo in your hand, perfect to find a play early, you know, beat some removal out, maybe play Elixir of Iron, keep them alive, have them pop off that way. But you have to remember that these guys are going to be tossing all the cards. And when they're tossing cards, the cards with shrooms attached to them are tossed as well, so you lose a lot of your shrooms. So one of the better ways to play is just, you know, for aggression and tempo a little bit early on, and then try to play all of your shrooms later with Puff Cat Peddler if you can. So you would then go like, you know, one or two peddlers and play all of your clouds when they're, you know, at like 12 to 13 cards, somewhere around then is usually fine. But basically just when they're deep and they're not wanting to toss anymore is ideally when you do it. And then they have a very small deck with a absolute shit ton of shrooms in it. So they'd be drawing like three or four a turn and just dying. That being said, sometimes it's not really something you can do and you have to play them early. And if you do have an early Teemo, that's you know, potentially going to level up and pop off, especially with ways to protect them in hand, like the Elixir of Iron, then Hank, go for man. Be my guess, it's still going to do a lot of work. Because I mean, if you go ahead and just like put 60 shrooms in his deck, sure you can toss like, I don't know, a third to half of them, but that's still like, you know, 30 or 40 left and you're perfectly happy with that, right? Other things to look out for in this matchup are the fact that this deck is actually deceptively strong at staying ahead on board early and kind of just fighting for board. So, you know, keep that in mind. You are going to want to be able to play units, pressure them, and, you know, keep stuff like Jaw Hunters in mind. That card's really good here because they do challenge your units, get rid of the bigger things, and, you know, that's one of the other key ways Tamo does die is just that. And Maokai is a card you really want to have the Thermo for on curve. Otherwise, the tossing is going to just get out of hand and they're going to be able to pop off with that. Does it mean ideally, you know, you still just level up the Sejuani and you play or you don't have to rely on shrooms? I want to talk about the shroom stuff first, though, because it does happen a lot where you're going to have to, you know, play this later on. And it's a very big part of the matchup, I think, is the, the ability to do that. Other than that, though, you're going to just want to be getting Sejuani leveled up as per usual and freezing all of these big units. So the freezing will allow you to play around Atrocity if you just hold a Mystic Shot, because when they get to the point that they have to play Atrocity, you can go ahead and Mystic Shot their face. And then, you know, the card does nothing and they try to go for the win. You don't care. And another piece of advice would be that sometimes when they have a lot of shrooms in their deck, I think that you should allow them to attack with Abyssal Eye because the draw will sometimes set up two turn lethal. If they draw an extra card, they'll die, and then you're kind of just happy in some cases. So I, I definitely won a couple games off that myself. I actually even had a tie um, with it the other day where my opponent attacked me with his Abyssal Eye, but he attacked first, and then his draw resolved before the rest of the damage that would have killed me happened. 
And we actually tied because I think I died the second the Abyssal Eye attacked. And then the draw resolved at the same time. He drew, got like three shrooms, and that was game. So allow them to draw uh, with the Abyssal Eye. Sometimes it will lead to lethals. And another thing with Devour of Depths, if you don't know, its obliterate effect is based on its health when it's not when it's played, but when the effect resolves. So if you see Devour of Depths trying to hit something with like, say, three health, you can Mystic Shot it. And then it will be a Devour of Depths with two health. And then it won't resolve into your three health unit. To do it on a Teemo, um, you know, Teemo's a 2-2 when he's leveled, so you can protect Teemo with that. Uh, if you just miss each other deaths, because equal is not less, so he would have to have 3 health, he has 2, so... Just a good thing to keep in mind of this matchup as well as that. And to kind of conclude things, I want to talk about the ways you win. Obviously, there's a Teemo pop-off, where you just have Teemo pop-off with all the shrooms, put 200 in your deck, and that just auto wins you the game. You also have, you know, the Teemo Sejuani ideal pan out. Teemo hits a bunch of times, Plunder Sejuani's flipped on 6, boom, perma freeze happens. Very easy way to win. But other things to keep in mind is that when you don't exactly have this happen, if you continue playing the game, you stall out, you will usually get to a point with double Tusk Reader, even one Tusk Reader, that you do get to pick up that Sejuani. And by that point, you usually will have played for your five plunders and then have the Sejuani stuff happen. So keep that in mind that, you know, you don't need to really necessarily have this happen fast in a lot of matchups, unless you're against like Ezreal. In that case, you are just going to lose. But try to make sure you're stalling as efficiently as possible if you don't have these champions. Play to get them. And if you, you know, you really need to, again, put like a babbling beard in your deck, for example. That'll get you a sedge. She'll be flipped. Boom. There you go. Flip sedge you want to Get the plunders off. You're good. You don't really need Teemos to even do that because you will have Mystic Shot. In my case, I play Static Shock as well. And those are five cards that are going to allow you to just plunder right away. I, I would just say approach this deck with a kind of mindset where, you know, the best way to win is with Teemo and sedge you want to, but it's not the only way to win. Because you can just get there with the cards like the Seer buffing all the units and then having like Ursine to follow that, that up with to give the buffed units Overwhelmer. You know, Tusk Reader is your only Sejuani. You know, you draw a 10-12 Sejuani. Boom, she's dead. Unfortunate. But now the rest of your deck has Overwhelm with the Spirit Walker, which is awesome, or just are big units that can overpower your opponents. You can also just win with Puff Cat Peddler, sh like shuffling Shrooms in your deck. Uh, it, sorry, shuffling Shrooms in your opponent's deck and putting like 40 in there and popping off with that. Or even just through like straight up units and better trades. So I, I would say, you know, obviously always try to stall for Teemo Sejuani, have those online, get the shrooms in the deck, and then, you know, try to have Sejuani flipped and then doing the permafrost stuff. That being said, that's not always possible, but you just need to realize that it's not possible and then kind of adjust your play style to either winning right now with the kind of uh, bigger unit type of play style or stalling, shuffling shrooms in your deck or stalling, buffing up units in your deck, stalling to Tusk Reader, and just figure out the best way to do that because... With this deck, it is very likely with the double toss creator that if you do make it to a later point in the game, you will be able to get those Sejuani's, have them online. But I think that some of you guys might just be losing before you get to that phase of the game. And that's why you say you feel like you only win with the champions. You're not giving yourself, you know, the best trades you possibly can. And I guess there's not really a great way to improve on that other than kind of being more cognizant of what you're doing when you play the game. Just be aware, think about what you're doing, you know, watch some of my YouTube videos, uh, but don't just watch them like the way that you normally would. My biggest tip for people when they're trying to learn a deck or something is like, again, do the pausing like with the mulligan, but then do it with like regular turns. So say you go, I don't know, here it's it's turn three. Do I, do I, I, I don't know what I'm doing there. There's a spell resolving, so I'm just going to wait. Like here, what am I going to block with? Well, I mean, I could chump block with the Omen Hawk. I could also take three damage or I could trade my, my chump bump into it or even the Puff Cap Peddler if I so choose. Could also take a trade and use Elixir of Iron here. It, it, all of these are, things are possibilities and they're things that you want to consider to make, you know, the best decision that you can. And well, I don't really know what I'm going to do, but now I'm going to unpause the video and see what control does. You know, I made my choice. Like, let's say that I want to, I don't know. Let's say I just want to pass here, for example, and then I want to miss it in next round. That's fine. That's, that's my decision. Okay. And then we're going to see what control does. Interesting. So control actually doesn't value the chump Womp. He says chump Womp could die and he doesn't even play Elixir of Iron Knight. That's interesting. And then maybe if you want to hear my analysis on that, you can unmute me and see what I say and, and why I do what I do. Sometimes I won't say that, but in most cases I will. And I'm not always right, but I think most of the time I am, at least in the context of this deck. So yeah, hopefully that helps as far as learning goes as to what you should do. And, you know, at least kind of understanding my play style with this as I do think that I've done pretty well with the deck, have, uh, you know, a long list of, uh, you know, victory royales and not that many defeats. So I think if you try to just learn from me, that'll be a helpful way for you to kind of improve your play style with this deck and maybe like survive a little bit longer to get to the main win con.
So just to conclude things, I want to say thanks for watching, guys. Timo Sejuani is a deck that I love, and it's one that I know a lot of you guys like as well. It's super, super fun. I'm not too sure if I'll do videos like this that often because it take a long time. I actually messed up my first recording, and I didn't even realize it until halfway through editing, so I wasted like three hours there. And, uh, well, now I've recorded the whole thing, and I'm talking over it again and need to edit it still, so... It's, uh, it's a huge time sink, so if you guys like the video, you find stuff like this helpful, please hit that like button, leave me a comment, and, you know, maybe I'll do, maybe I'll do another one on another deck in the future, we'll see. But, you know, this one I kind of wanted to do because it's just, like, you know, close to my heart. So thanks for watching, guys. I appreciate it. Have a great day, and links to gameplay will be in the end notes or, again, in the description. Have a great day.